progress. Happy Sabbath, brothers and sisters. As we come together today, shall we seek the Lord's blessing to come to an understanding of that which he has provided before us so that we may be benefited by the light that is behind us for the path that is in front of us. Shall we pray? <laughs> Loving Father in heaven, as we come before you on this Sabbath, we thank you for your guidance and your direction and the many blessings that you have provided us in the week that is past and the rest that we are enjoying on this Sabbath. Help us now, Father, as we consider the words from your scripture, as we consider the warnings that you have provided. Help us that we may take these things to heart, that we may come into an understanding so that we may be prepared better for the task that is soon before us. I thank you, Father, for each one that is here at this meeting and for those that will attend it later, that will view this later by, by video. Direct us now, guide us, please, in all things, so that our characters may become more like yours. For this, we thank you and we praise you in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Okay. June 8, 1886 was 136 years and three days ago. But we have a message that Mrs. White gave to us at that time. The true people of God who have the spirit of the work of the Lord and the salvation of souls at heart will ever view sin in its real sinful character. They will always be on the side of faithful and plain dealing with sins, which easily beset the people of God, especially in the closing work for the church in the sealing time of the 144,000 who are to stand without fault before the throne of God, will they feel most deeply the wrongs of God's professed people? This is forcibly set forth by the prophet's illustration of the last work under the figure of the men, each having a slaughter weapon in his hand. One man clothed one man among them with clothed, clothed with linen, with a rider's inkhorn by his side. And the Lord said unto him, go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for the abominations that will be done in the midst thereof. So, um, June 8th, 1886. Yes. Is 144 years to the day from that Pentecost date I have in 2030. Okay. So, so that definitely relates to a message of what, what we did study last night dealing with the sixth day of the third month. And of course, she mentioned this 144,000 here. So being 144 days or 144 years, pardon me, uh, to June 8th, 2030, I think is interesting. What I was finding to be most intriguing as we get through this, yeah. Mrs. White is, is tying Zephaniah in with Ezekiel 8 and 9, mm -hmm. with Ezekiel's second vision, right? 
Yep. The 666 symbol. Okay. 665 plus the one day that 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 he continues that vision. Okay. So here we are. Mrs. White states, and if so, if you have a, a difference of opinion with what is being stated here, please take up your difference with her. This is forcibly set forth by the prophet's illustration of the last work. What does it mean to you that this is forcibly set forth? That it's emphasized that we really need. That we really need what? We need to be reproved for our sins. I mean, we need to stand naked before God and let the Holy Spirit work in our lives to reform us. Is this not saying this is something on which we need to be paying attention? So, this is forcibly set forth by Ezekiel's vision of the last work, the vision where he sets himself among the vision. Under the figure of the men, each having a slaughter weapon in his hand. Is this a literal weapon of destruction? No. So we are speaking figuratively here. Uh -huh. One man amongst the others was clothed with linen, with a writer's ink horn by his side. And the command of the Lord was stated. And the Lord said unto him, go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem. Is there any doubt what's being referred to here? Is this not the movement? Well, we definitely have to apply it to the movement, especially based upon the fact that Ezekiel is the prophet of this movement. His message is about our message. Okay. And set a mark on the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. Have we not seen the abominations? that are going on currently within this movement. The abominations that are in line with the abominations that are going on within the church. The fact that they do not see the lines and how all of these are interrelated with the work that is yet before us. Who are standing in the council of God at this time? It is those who virtually excuse wrongs among the professed people of God and murmur in their hearts, if not openly, against those who would reprove sin. Is it those who take their stand against them and sympathize with those who commit wrong? No, indeed. These, unless they repent and leave the work of Satan in oppressing those who have the burden of the work and in holding up the hands of sinners in Zion, will never receive the mark of God's sealing approval. They will fall in the general destruction of all the wicked 
represented by the five men bearing slaughter weapons. Mark this point with care. Those who receive the pure mark of truth wrought in them by the power of the Holy Ghost, represented by the man in linen, are those that sigh and that cry for all of the abominations that are done in the church. Their love for purity and the honor and the glory of God is such that they have so clear a view of the exceeding sinfulness of sin that they are represented as being in an agony, even sighing and crying. <clears throat> when Mrs. White says, mark this point with care, how should we accept this admonition? Should we treat it frivol frivolously? Should we go about our own business and our own thought processes and our own opinions as if we are greater than God or greater than the prophets that he has sent? No, we should be studying and paying more attention to what's going on and reading God's word more. Agreed. So here we are today at this time. She is telling us to mark this with care because of all of the abominations that are done within the movement and within the church. This is a warning and an admonition to us directly. But the general slaughter of all those who do not thus see the wide contrast between sin and righteousness and do not feel as those do who stand in the counsel of God and receive the mark is described in the order of the five men with slaughter weapons. Go ye after him through the city and smite. Let not your eye spare, neither have ye pity. Slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women, but come not near any man upon whom is the mark and begin at my sanctuary. Where is the work to begin? It is to begin at the sanctuary. Is this the sanctuary that is built by man's hands? This no. is to, to begin with the leaders, is it not? Mm -hmm. If the leaders cannot stand, then what happens? This work is to begin at God's sanctuary. There's a there was a series of questions that were asked toward the end of the meeting last week. This next paragraph covers part of that clearly. God said to Joshua in the case of Achan's sins, neither will I be with you anymore except ye destroy the accursed from among you. 
How does this instance compare with the course pursued by those who will not raise their voice against sin and wrong, but whose sympathies are ever found with those who trouble the camp of Israel with their sins? Said God to Joshua, Thou canst not stand before thine enemies until ye take away the accursed thing from among you. He pronounced the punishment which should follow the transgression of his covenant. What had Achan transgressed? What is she saying here? Go ahead, sorry. Well, it's the covenant. How was the covenant transgressed by Achan taking the golden wedge, the Babylonish garment, and the other items? How, how did he transgress that covenant? Well, by sinning, you transgress against the covenant. But what covenant is being transgressed? Well, it's the covenant that was made on uh, Mount Sinai, for one. Did Achan <clears throat> transgress the covenant by deciding not to listen to God's direct command? Mm hmm Are we any different today if we pick and choose the words of God that we are not, that we are or are not going to adhere to? Well, we're transgressing the covenant if we pick and choose, yes. So, <clears throat> in the meeting of apostasy that occurred in Germany, when there were those that chose to follow the word of Parminder and of Tess that said that the salvation of the sisters was based upon their method of dress and that their salvation would be as long as they were wearing slacks. Setting aside the health message, is that not a transgression of the covenant? Yep. If we choose to pick and choose what we will eat, but we decide that Modern science has said that cheese is good for you, that dairy is necessary, and we should follow the science. Are we not setting aside the health message? Mm -hmm. If we set aside the health message, are we not transgressing the covenant? These are the considerations that we need to make today. For as God said to Joshua, neither will I be with you anymore except ye destroy the accursed from among you. What are we to see here, God's frown is upon those that are choosing now to seek separation from their brothers and sisters.
neither will I be with you anymore, except you destroy the accursed from among you. Do you wish to be separated from God? There is no such thing as a little sin. Achan's sin was setting himself above the word of God. Achan transgressed the covenant as it is being shown within this passage. If we choose to set aside the covenant, if we choose to think that the covenant is of none effect, then we are no different than Achan. Joshua then began a diligent search to find out the guilty one. He took Israel by their tribes and then by their families and next individually. Achan was designated as the guilty one but that the matter might be plain to all Israel, that there should be no occasion given them to murmur and to say that the guiltless was made to suffer. Joshua used policy. He knew that Achan was the transgressor and that he had concealed his sin and provoked God against his people. Joshua discreetly induced Achan to make confession of his sin, that God's honor and justice should be vindicated before Israel. And Joshua said unto Achan, my son, give, I pray thee, glory to the Lord God of Israel, and make confession unto him, and tell me now what thou hast done. Hide it not from me. What does this passage say to us today? Well, when we deal with this diligent search, um, you know, the way that this is normally understood is we're going to try to find out who in the church is the problem, why the church isn't being blessed. That's often how it's sort of addressed. But in this case, this is really about a personal examination. Right. So, so what we have to do is look at this in our own personal lives. If we're not willing to examine our own personal lives, if we are not willing to also come together, confessing our sins, praying together, if there are those that seek to cast others out, because they don't like their opinions, they don't like their words, they don't like their tone. Then we're being told that they really don't like the examination that's going on. Joshua had to conduct a diligent search. Joshua had to be direct so that the guilty party would be revealed before all of Israel.
And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and thus and thus have I done. When I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonian garment and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight, then I coveted them and took them, and behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver under it. So Joshua sent messengers, and they ran into the tent, and behold, it was hid in his tent, and the silver under it. And they took them out of the midst of the tent, and brought them unto Joshua, and unto all the children of Israel, and laid them out before the Lord. And Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerah, and the silver, and the garment, and the wedge of gold, and his sons, and his daughters, and his oxen, and his asses, and his sheep, and his tent, and all that he had, and they brought them unto the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, Why hast thou troubled us? The Lord shall trouble thee this day. And all Israel stoned him with stones and burned them with fire after they stoned them with stones. Two hundred shekels of silver. Were we not addressing the number 200 again last night? Mm -hmm. We have 50 shekels of gold. We have one goodly Babylonian garment. We have one goodly Babylonian garment that is representing the character. But what do the 200 shekels of silver and the 50 shekels wedge of gold represent for us today? How can we apply these symbols with what we are studying currently? Well, we looked at before, you know, this is a tongue of gold. Right. Um, so this has to do with a message. Agreed. Um, not, not, not a good one. Sorry, go ahead. Not, not a good one. But it's a 50 shekels weight. And... A message that has led some to covet this message. Mm -hmm. That some see the message as being so important that they must hold on to it. That they must have it. That like the Babylonian garment, they need this because of the world that is around them. Well, they want to be accepted by the world. Correct. You know, I mean, so part of the problem with July 18th is, I mean, and I went through those feelings as well prior to July 18th. You know, the idea, well, you know, if Nashville occurs, we will be able to have an influence with our friends and family who know about our prediction. And, and that didn't sit well with me because I recognize that that's not how God works. You 
you know, things, things just don't, things aren't that easy. And, you know, Aiken here is sort of trying to take the easy way out. He's depending upon himself. He's not trusting that God has a purpose and a plan. I mean, it, it makes no sense to covet this, these items uh, because God's going to provide everything for him anyway. I mean, I don't even know what these items would benefit him, really. Well, as, as you just earlier said, the representation of this golden tongue is a message. How does a message, much like the world, benefit the movement? Yeah, we're, we're not going to have, we're not going to, if we're not following what God's teaching, we're not going to have the influence that we imagine. And I think even the question is, why? what is it that we want to influence? You know, what is our purpose in, you know, evangelism, for instance? What benefit is there for our Heavenly Father? If the message that is being proclaimed is very much like that of the world, how is his character being lifted up? It's not, is it? The problem that, that is here. Here is a message, a, a message of gold, something that others are valuing. Is it of true gold or is it of pyrite? We know that the Babylonian garment is something to be shunned. We know that by taking these items that Achan transgressed the covenant. Is the covenant being transgressed by trying to promote a message that God would not have promoted? We're in a different right and see it or excuse me, whoever else is listening, what just comes to mind, especially after I listened to Conrad Vine's speech this morning to Parle on the to the world. Romans. Uh, Romans 117, right down to the end of the chapter. I mean, I can see the progression when we're demoting God to the status of man, and when we dare to impose mandates on people against their consciences, violating their consciences, and yet proclaiming on the other hand that we're standing for religious liberty and the freedom of conscience and all the confusion and the destruction that that has brought upon not only the mainstream church, but it's stumbled souls, it's destroyed livelihoods. Like you, you need to hear Conrad Vine's speech. Like I really believe this man is, is a reformer. He's to reform the church within and more and more he's discovering it's just about irreparable. 
And I just feel the grief. And no, he does not have all the light we have, but he's really living up to the light that he presently has. And I really think that we need to reach out to him and say, look, there's, there's an alternative to all of this. You know, we're not perfect people, but there are people among us that are sincerely seeking God and sincerely seeking that personal reformation. And with all the gifts that he has, he reminds me of Paul. He reminds me of Martin Luther, whom he quotes and refers to in his speech. It's, it's amazing to me, the courage of this man. And he's calling the GC and Carl persecutors now, like he called out James Standish and this uh, other guy, Miller, Nick, Nick Miller. And I mean, I don't even, I haven't read any of this stuff. I haven't gone online to look at it, but I probably should. And just see how guilty the people, the elitists in the mainstream are, and how this also is speaking to me as an individual for my intolerance and self-righteousness. You know, we need to really, every reproof that we get, even if we don't even like the person that's reproving us, we need to analyze it. Is this from God? I mean, I've had my unregenerate children reproved me for a false and I needed it at that time. I still need them. You know, it doesn't matter who is reproving you. Weigh it and see, let it cut to the heart. If it's of God, then we should take it and correct ourselves with the help of God. Not get under condemnation of Satan, but say, Lord, I'm so weak. It's a marvel that you can use me at all. And, and I was really thankful the last couple of days. I had a long talk with a sister. And man, she reamed me out, but in so much love and so much humor. And I was receptive to it. And I'm, and I'm so thankful she did that. Amen. To be very direct, if the golden tongue is a message, and I believe that to be correct, the involvement of politics, the involvement of current worldly opinion within this movement, I think is being represented by this transgression of the covenant. Mm -hmm. Now, um, just to comment on something there that Angela said about reaching out to this person. Right now, this movement can't reach out to anyone other than somebody that God puts in our way uh, because the movement isn't ready uh, for, that, for that role. Well, maybe not as a movement, like it, generally speaking, but I really feel it on my heart that I should reach out to him and encourage him and say, look, I'm going through some of this. Not so much. I have a heavy struggle because he was part of that elitist group, right? I mean, yeah, he still yeah. is in a way. But, but, but you know, I just say, I, I sympathize yeah. with you, brother. You know, and, and yes, I see the corruption that, you're, that you've mentioned, and I stand with you on freedom of conscience. But you don't really have a, we don't really have a message to give. We can't direct them to this movement or anything like that. I mean, obviously you can talk to anyone. But right now, as far as this message is concerned, um, we're not in a position to give a message to the Levites. And, and the time will come when those who are seeking truth will come to this movement, to the message that this movement has. But right now, this movement doesn't have a message. Its, its work is internal. You know, so I, I understand, you know, the, the, the idea. You see somebody who's, who is standing for truth in the level that they understand. You know, they're, they're living up to the light that they have. And we think, well, we can give them more light. But it's not the time yet. That's all I'm saying. Is yeah, and that, I believe he can, 
can give us some light. Well, well, I don't. Well, that's I think, I think, I think, I think, I think. Everybody I think has something of value yeah. to give. Okay, but this is a mistake that this movement has made time and time again. People in this movement watching videos from from other people who have truth, but that truth is something we already have in the spirit of prophecy, right? We already have this light. It's not it's not any new light. It's something that we all should know and understand already. And what we need to be looking for is the light that God is giving us. That's where our attention should be directed. And I've seen so many people who are watching videos, um, you know, dealing with the pandemic and dealing with all these things. And I keep getting all these links to these different videos. And I watch the videos and they might have some light in them, but they have so much darkness in them as well. That is, they have darkness, not because they're teaching error, but because they don't see the light. They don't have the light that this movement has. And, and so I'm just saying this as, I see it as a danger when people are watching Save to Serve and things like this because they, they, they hear messages that resonate with them. Um, I, don't, I don't think that's wise at this time. I, I think this well, is specifically addressing them. If we're focusing more on that, but I, I'm not. I very seldom watch anything but what I what I'm part of right now, you know. But yeah, I, I, I I just yeah, I sense this. I mean, he really reminds, as I said before, Martin Luther and and Paul. I mean, look at that uh, part of the Sanhedrin who's coming out or part of the monastery, part of that horrible Roman Catholic system who's coming out of that, he's standing up close to it and he's risking everything to do this. And that is so admirable. Yeah, and, and you know, I'm not and, saying and if he, that. I'm just saying that. The Lord will lead him further if he continues, yeah, if he, yeah. Yeah, I understand. There's he needs encouragement. Like, well, yeah, and there's nothing wrong with encouraging people. What I'm saying is that people in this movement need to be studying this this message. And I'm not talking necessarily about you, but uh, I'm saying that people are, there. There's, there is light that God has given. To me, this message about the Babylonian garment needs to be t understood in its proper context. That is, there is messages around that really are nothing more than the Babylonian garment. And in order to discern that, we have to understand the covenant that God wants us uh, to participate in with him, right? So he's making a covenant with us. And so I understand, I understand all the feelings that you're talking about. I understand, you know, that desire, the desire to reach people. Um, yeah. but, but this movement isn't in a place to do that yet. As individuals, obviously we can. We can reach out to whoever God puts in our path or whoever we feel convicted to, to talk to. But this movement isn't dependent upon, for instance, a lot of people would like to see, oh, if we can get, and I'm not saying you're doing this, but, you know, if, if this person could hear this, this message, you know, they would be so powerful for this message. And this movement has done that for a long time. And Jeff always uh, rejected that idea. You know, he rejected the idea of contacting the different pastors or leaders, you know, to, to give the message to them. He didn't believe that that was useful. And because these people will come when it is time. God will lead them to this okay. message, right? And, yeah, and he so, led me and I was a wreck and I still am. Well, we're all kind of a wreck, but... Um, but but the point is that right now we have a message that God is giving us, and many in this movement are being attracted to this Babylonian garment, to this wedge of gold, to the uh, 200 shekels of silver. These are the things that they think, it, to me it's like winning a lottery. People People want the easy way out, and God isn't giving us an easy way at all that's for sure 
right? So, you know, it, you know. Anyway, it, it, to me, what what this message is is telling us is that in order for us to, if we have this desire to help others, we first have to figure out our own situation because we're not really in the position to help others. Any of our efforts to, to reach out to others will do more damage than good because we're not truly converted and we don't really have a message. And, and I think that's what we're learning from what we're reading here this morning. Okay. Okay, Dwight. Sorry to interrupt. Well, that's good. It, 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 it helps us clarify some things. Now, as Mrs. White continued, God holds his people as a body responsible for sins existing in individuals among them. Is there any more plain statement by her in this particular article? If we're going to give a message the body, mm -hmm. all of the body, is to be respectful to each other, but that the sins are to be purged. Mm -hmm. If there is a neglect with the leaders of the church to diligently search out the sins which bring the displeasure of God upon his people as a body, they become responsible for those sins. Do you want someone else to be responsible for your sins? I've seen the fruits of my sins with others and I'm telling you it's it's still, it's a daily hurt. I see the results of my bad influence on, on my children. But you're not answering example. the question, sister. Do you want your sins to be the responsibility of someone else? Yes or no? Well, that's how I interpreted it, it uh, Dwight. That if I'm sinning and I'm holding on to that sin and I'm a terrible influence on others, they're in a sense being responsible because they're going to be influenced by that. They're, they might be stumbled out of the way. I get blunt because too many times we don't want to answer the yes or the no. I don't want others, I don't want a leader to have to be responsible for my sins. I don't want to be responsible for someone else's sins. Well, well this is a difficult problem. I mean, because we have a body. So we can look at this movement as a body. And we have evils that exist within this body. Right. And, and, but we don't really have a leader. I mean, we don't have a, a proper chain of command or anything. We have basically, if you want to look at it, we're a bunch of self-appointed leaders. If, I mean, people are making decisions for others based upon the fact that they happen to have that uh, ability to do that. Right. We, we don't, we don't sit and vote as, vote as a body. Um, you know, there's just, we're, we're a scattered flock. But we do have leaders in the sense of, of, you know, we give studies in some sense, that's being a leader, I guess. But when it comes to how we would search out the sins of a group of people, the only thing that we can do is point people to the word of God and to the light that God is giving us. Um, 
as far as others are concerned. But then we have as individuals a responsibility to address the things in ourselves. So, so this is a, a sort of a difficult situation. I mean, you know, for instance, um, you know, if any one of us considered ourselves a leader, what, what could we do regarding the problems that exist in this movement? I think this this article is giving us an instruction as to what we are to do. Yeah, but it, but it's not an easy, uh, no. simple. There's not a simple solution. Well, now, th well, the next sentence here says, "But this is the nicest work that men ever in, that men ever engaged in in to deal with minds, because this is really about minds." Right. And, and, and the word nice doesn't mean, you know, pleasant. It means um, fine or subtle, right? It's, it's a very delicate, would be another way of looking at it. It's a very delicate work. Um, and, you know, just even in, you know, having these discussions here, when somebody says something, um, you know, how we respond to them, it, it can be perceived in very different ways by different people. You know, Angela is not really going to be offended and, you know, she doesn't think I'm dismissive of her because I disagree. But some people will watch this video and they'll see the exchange that Angela and I had and they will think that I was dismissive of her. I have people write me all the time saying you're very dismissive of other people's opinions. And and yet I know I'm not. I'm just very particular about what's being said and i always want to clarify everything so so it, it is a it is a delicate work um but it's one that only the holy spirit in in us cooperating with the holy spirit can we in any way reach uh, the human heart that we can affect people for good it's it's not something that we should just jump into uh you know without thought and without prayer and that's very wise counsel and, and then she says next all are not fitted to correct the airing They have not wisdom to deal justly while loving mercy. Yeah. And of course, it's easy to see that in other people. I've seen people who, when they correct the erring, uh, they're just doing damage. I mean, they're, uh, they're using a chainsaw when a surgeon's tool is what is required. They're using a chainsaw when a scalpel would be the better. Yeah. Uh, two choices, yes. Mm -hmm. But you know that also there is a difference in character in every one of us. And mm -hmm. even though one person may not reach a, a mass of people, uh, one person can reach one or two mm -hmm. or whatever they, whatever they can uh, associate with and, and have, uh, have some kind of impact in their lives. Mm -hmm. Well, this, this is why it's important to have different speakers, different people presenting truth, for instance. Um, you know, there's some people who just can't stand listening to me. I just, and, and I can understand why. It's, it's, it's not very, I'm not a very black and white, straightforward, linear thinker. And so I can't, I mean, I can do my best to try to present that way. But some people will like Daniel Fontenot, his presentations, they can get more out of it than they can get out of mine and vice versa. So um, the mistake that we can make is to think that our way of looking at the world is the only correct way. There is one truth that's objective truth. But when it comes to the human mind, we're not all constituted the same. And, and so the wisdom that's needed, sometimes the, whole, the Holy Spirit is definitely needed, 
uh, to reach someone that differs from me, for me to understand the words that I need to say or, or what's perceived about my actions. Um, without the Holy Spirit's work, uh, we, we wouldn't be very effective at all in dealing with other minds, and especially in the area of reproving sin. If there is a neglect with the leaders of the church to diligently search out the sins which brings the displeasure of God upon this, his people as a body, they become responsible for those sins. But this is the nicest work that men ever engaged in to deal with minds. All are not fitted to correct the erring. They have not wisdom to deal justly while loving mercy. They will not be inclined to see the necessity of mingling love and tender compassion with faithful reproof of wrongs. Some will ever be needlessly severe and will not feel the necessity of the injunction of the apostle. And if some have compassion making a difference and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire. There are many who do not have the discretion of Joshua and who have no special duty to search out wrongs and to deal promptly with the sins existing among them. Let not such hinder those who have the burden of this work upon them. Let them not stand in the way of those who have this duty to do. Some make it a point to question and doubt and find fault because others do the work that God has not laid upon themselves. These stand directly in the way to hinder those upon whom God has laid the burden of reproof and of correcting the sins that are prevailing that his frown may be turned away from his people. Should a case like Achan's be among us, there are many who would accuse those who might act the part of Joshua in searching out the wrong of having a fault-finding wicked spirit. God is not to be trifled with and his warnings disregarded with impunity by a perverse people. Is Achan among us today? Mm -hmm. With all the light that has been given, with all of the examples that we have had presented, for Achan to be among us today is a fearful thing. The manner of Achan's confession is similar to the confessions that some have made and will make among us. They hide their wrongs and refuse to make a voluntary confession until God searches them out and then they acknowledge their sins. A few persons pass on in a course of wrong until they become hardened. They may even know that the church is burdened as Achan knew that Israel were made weak before their enemies because of his guilt. Yet their consciences do not condemn them. They will not relieve the church by humbling their proud rebellious hearts before God and putting away their wrongs. God's displeasure is upon his people. 
and he will not manifest his power in their midst while sins are existing among them and fostered by those in responsible positions. This warning should have been repeated prior to July 18th. We are repeating this warning after July 18th as a realization that we have a responsibility that we cannot be like Achan. We cannot be holding on to these sins and expecting God to bless us. This is an admonition to the movement as a whole, just as much as it was an admonition in 1886 to the entire church. We cannot afford as individuals or as a movement to set this aside any longer. How are we to view the warnings that Mrs. White has given us in the health message? How are we to view her admonitions regarding diet? How are we to view the different positions that so many take to be much like the world? For is this not positions that are being taken that are against God. If we are standing against God, then we are indeed like Achan. For we have been chosen to disregard his covenant. Those who work in the fear of God to rid the church of hindrances and to correct grievous wrongs that the people of God may see the necessity of abhorring sin and that they may prosper in purity and the name of God be glorified will ever meet with resisting influences from the unconsecrated. Zephaniah describes the true state of this class and the terrible judgments that will come upon them. And it shall come to pass at that time that I will search Jerusalem with candles and punish the men that are settled on their lees, that say in their heart, the Lord will not do good, neither will he do evil. Zephaniah 1 verse 12. Are we not comparing this passage of Zephaniah directly with the warnings of Ezekiel and the lamentations of Jeremiah? The great day of the Lord is near. It is near and hastens greatly. 
even the voice of the day of the Lord, the mighty men shall cry there bitterly. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of the trumpet and alarm against the fenced cities and against the high towers. And I will bring distress upon men that they shall walk like blind men because they have sinned against the Lord and their blood shall be as poured out as dust and their flesh as the dung. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in that day of the Lord's wrath. But the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy, and he shall make even a speedy riddance of all them that dwell in the land. Zephaniah 1, 14 to 18. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath. Well, it comes with silver and gold as, as uh, their influence will die too. Right. Their influence and all that comes with it will go, go away. But as we have recently within this meeting been examining, if Achan's golden tongue and this 200 shekels of silver are indeed a message. Will this message of gold or silver deliver those that have chosen not to accept what the Lord is doing? I look at this warning as being very plain. I look at it being very direct for us today. Because if the great day of the Lord is near, and as this is repeating, it said, it is near. Is this not a doubling? Is this not representational of the second angel's message? And it hasteneth greatly. Even the voice of the day of the Lord, the mighty men shall cry there bitterly. Brothers and sisters, there are only two sides. Either there will be those that come to an understanding of a message that is to be given that is represented by the men with slaughtering weapons in their hands, or it will be represented by those that will be slaughtered. Which side are we on? Whose garment, whose character are we wearing? Are we choosing the Babylonian garment? Or are we standing with the man clothed in linen? Which side are we? God will not be trifled with. It is in the time of conflict when the true colors should be flung to the breeze. It is then the standard bearers need to be firm and let their true position be known. It is then 
that the skill of every true soldier for the right is tested. Shirks can never wear the laurels of victory. Those who are true and loyal and will not conceal the fact, but will put heart and might into the work and venture their all in the struggle. Let the battle turn as it will. God is a sin-hating God. And those who will encourage the sinner, saying, it is well with thee, God will curse. Are we seeking the curse of God? Or are we seeking the approval of God? What are we to do? Can Mrs. White be any more plain than she has been in low these 10 paragraphs? Any further comment or thought? The message of Zephaniah uh, the only thing I can say is that God is giving us a message that is meant to bring repentance. Right. And and the question is, are we going to heed that message or not? And And the simple way to judge that a message is from God is to judge our own reaction to it. Because All right. Message that comes from God always brings conviction. It always points out your sin and not someone else's sin. And and it and it does help us to to reach those that are I mean, because we know that this is the body, right? We can identify with what's happening in the movement. You know, one part of the body suffers, the whole body suffers. And right now, this movement is suffering. And we have to try to figure out what we can do. And and I think the only thing that we can do is what we have been doing, and that is to continue studying and receiving the light that God has. And in prayer and repentance... Um, seeking him and trusting that he's going to take care of the situation that we have no control over. Because I think part of the thing is, is the struggle is what is it that I'm supposed to do? Um, you know, in a situation like this, what is it that God's asking of me? What was Achan to have done? Well, Achan was supposed to just obey God. He was to take God at his word. Yeah. Right? Yeah, to just trust that God was going to take care of his people. Okay. And that's sometimes the hardest thing to do. We can imagine that we're, we're helping God when actually we're hindering him. Are we just helping ourselves, really? Are we to be doing for God or are we to be following God? Well, we follow God. 
too many times, I have heard the comment that we are doing this for God. There is nothing in man's ability, nothing in man's strength, nothing in God, in man's character to commend him to God. What God asks of us is to believe and to follow, to accept that he is able to do according to his word. If we're not willing to accept that he's able to do according to his word, if we're not willing to accept that he sent the manna, that he has sent words of reproof to show us the sins that we need to purge from our lives. If we're not willing to accept that he is able to do just as he has promised, then we indeed have a problem. And the problem resides within us. God gave his word to our first parents. The only admonition that he gave is that they were not to eat from this tree in the midst of the garden. Everything else, no problem. This tree, no. The word of God was rejected. And by its rejection, the darkness of sin fell upon this world. There are those that would say that Adam and Eve really didn't do anything wrong. They are excusing the choices that were made. We could get into all sorts of things that are currently publicly being addressed. The point is, that the word of God is clear. Here is what we are to do. We are to rest in his word. We are to accept his word as it is written. We are to walk according to this light. If we choose to set aside the light, we are choosing to do so to our own detriment and to our own destruction. Yes, brother. Salvation is an individual thing, right? Not a communal thing. Mm -hmm. Right. Was salvation offered to Ahab? Did he have the opportunity to accept what God was doing in the nation of Israel? I'm certain that he did. Was salvation available? and offered to Ananias and Sapphira. Yes. As we go through these things, was salvation available 
and offered to Achan. No different. Okay. But yet each made a choice. Exactly. The children of Israel were weakened by the sin of one and the omission of his family. Right now, the movement has been troubled. A diligent search is necessary. We must each search our own hearts just as the apostles did in the upper room. Because it is only after searching their own hearts, confessing their sins, and seeking God's approval that they were prepared for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that occurred on Pentecost. Is our work any different today? No. Okay. Now, we have a few minutes remaining in our time today. Any other thoughts or comments regarding what we have been addressing? Any other questions? Well, the only the only thing um, just relating to our morning studies where we're studying judges. Right. And, and we're looking at the messages which are symbolized by um, the messages in this movement that have that affected this movement that are symbolized by the enemies that God has left uh, to test us. And, and when we look at the story of Joshua and Judges, I mean, this is what you see God doing is developing a people by precept and example um, that are going to be able to be victorious, that are going to learn to trust in him. I mean, that's what the whole Bible is about. And, you know, we had, you know, the study last night, we had looked at these 20 prophetic years and the 20 prophetic months. 20 years in in various ways um and we could connect this to the message of 9 11 which is a message of othniel the holy spirit to bring repentance and and we always have to start there but many of us want to skip that step many of us pretty much all of us want to skip that step we, we somehow want to get to the end without going through the proper steps to follow that, that journey. We become Seventh-day Adventists, and, and we believe we're Christians because we know all kinds of things, but we have never experienced true repentance and a true forsaking of sin. Most of what we believe is a way to make ourselves feel good about ourselves rather than to actually change. You know, the gospel is about self-esteem in, in our minds, how we feel about ourselves. And mostly that's going to be 
seen in our attitudes towards others. If we have a negative attitude towards other people, we have to really try to figure out why that is, why we aren't encouraging um, God's people rep by reproof. If that, that makes sense. Because we can encourage people in their sins. And, and the reason we do that is because we want to be in our sins still. Or we can reprove people in accordance with how the Holy Spirit has worked in our lives in a restorative manner, not in an accusatory manner. Okay. I don't see a reason of disagreement. Yeah. Now, can I, can I just show you some little chronological thing that I noticed? Sure. Okay. So I'll share my screen here. So, you know, last night we looked at these um, 20 years. Right. And so I noticed that if we went from September 11th, 2001, if we count 20 prophetic years, that is years of 360 days, we come to May 29th, 2021. And, and this is all part of the structure, which I'm not going to go into at the moment. But um, the interesting thing that I just noticed is here in the bottom right hand corner. That May 29th is the 16th day of the second month. So that's a, a powerful symbol. It's the symbol of uh, February 16th. Right. It's the symbol of 216, which is six times six times six. Um, and it's interesting that from May 29th, there's 216 days remaining in the year 2021. So, so it's 216 days from May 29th, 2021 to January 1st, 2022. And of course, 2022 is a symbol of the first day of the first month. And so you have these symbols in Samuel Snow's letters as well. But also from May 29th to December 25th, 2021, the period of time in between those two dates, from the end of May 29th, 2021, to the beginning of December 25th, 2021, is 209 days. December 25th, 2021, as we know, is the 20th day of the ninth month. And, and this is a period of time in which God has been working in this movement to, to reprove us, to correct us. And, and that's still continuing, right? We have, we have seen in these lines that God has, has a work uh, that has been going on, and we can recognize it in the messages uh, in the book of Judges and in the messages in the Minor Prophets. And the question is, are we going to really heed these messages? And if we neglect the chronology that God has given us, if we neglect the light that he has been pouring upon us, there is no means by which he can actually correct us. There's no means left. Because if, if, we, if we reject light, God can't continue to give us light because we're not willing to receive it. If we are rejecting light, are we also not rejecting his covenant? Yeah. And, and so when he wants to make covenant with us, he's, he's given us a very specific way in which he wants us to do that, in, in, in the way that he's bringing us together. And, and he's showing that it's his work, that it's from him. It's not something that's produced by man. And, and so to me, it'll be marvelous when we see this work accomplished. Yes, it will. Mm -hmm. It may not turn out the way we think it should be either. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, we have to trust that God's going to take care of this whole situation, everything that's gone on in this movement, um, and everything that's happening in our personal lives as well. These are controlled by God. Powerful. Okay, do we have anything else to address today? Shall we then close with prayer? Gracious Father, help us each one so that our hearts may be examined, so that we may be then prepared and made ready to enter into covenant with you. Reveal to us our deficiencies our faults, our sins. Help us now that we may be made ready, that we may accept our great need of you. Be with us today. We thank you, Father, for the lessons, the examples, for all that you are doing to show us the path on which we need our feet to be walking. Direct us now and through the balance of this day, for this we thank you and this we praise you. In the name of amen. Amen. Mm -hmm.